Why are you wasting your, you could learn from this conversation if you would just shut up and listen, you know, and, and I think people are afraid to look ignorant and they're afraid to, yeah. um, to be silent, which is weird to me. They, they want to be talking because the internet encourages content, 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 but it's like produce the content that you're comfortable with. If you don't know anything about the music business, don't make music business content. Yeah. If all you want to, if, if your only experience in the music business is making music, then make music and let that be the content. Let that be the core of your content. Yo, what's good people? It's Jay Cactus and we're back again with episode 24 of Cactus Combos now. In today's episode, I have a legend with me. He's produced for some of the goats like 50 Cent, Rick Ross, and Ludacris, and he's done a lot for the producer community with his podcast, tutorials now and again, <laughs> And he's just constantly dropping gems for people. He goes by DJ Pain One. Pain One, how's it going, man? I'm sorry, you threw me off by using the L word. Uh, <laughs> the legend. <laughs> what, what, what's going on, man? <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Sorry to drop that one on you. But I feel like you have done a lot for the community, though. I mean, I've been, even since the start Yeah, of... but I mean, like, you know, <laughs> 45 King is a legend. Uh, DJ Pain One is... A guy. I'm a uh, factor. I'm not being modest. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even since even since the start of my journey as a producer, you've always been someone that I've followed. You've always been someone that I've got information from. So I appreciate you like now coming on the podcast, which is kind of crazy. Well, hey, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'm happy to have been a part of that journey. No problem. So, man, one thing that always stood out to me, like even from watching you years back, I feel like you always knew that it wasn't enough to just be a good producer. I feel like you always had it figured out. You always knew that you, you know, that wasn't going to be enough. You had to like do everything. You had to be on YouTube. You had to be getting your face out there. Can you remember what kind of sparks that mindset for you? Uh, I, I'm sorry to say this. Uh, you're wrong about that. <laughs> I, uh, I definitely thought Maybe it was that all, all figured I out, but you know no no i mean none of it was figured out i think probably within the last 3 years i've had a, a more um i guess uh, i've had a clearer direction yeah but prior to that i mean even when i started youtube I, and i dropped the ball in a lot of ways because i didn't have a direction and because i really did think that the power of my production and my catalog alone would be enough for me to you know, sustain my career. And right. granted, for a lot of producers, it is. Uh, you know, there are plenty of producers that don't have these crazy uh, content strategies or, yeah. or or content strategies at all. But they're, they're in the minority. I'm talking about like they're the top 5% of producers. Right. Whereas for me to really sustain myself um, creatively and financially... I have to do a lot. I have to really be a hustler. So I learned luckily how to create content for all these platforms early on, just because mm. that was, I, I always just wanted to know how to, how to accomplish things. Uh, and I think production is a kind of a gateway drug to other forms of technology. Yeah. You, know, you, you learn how to make beats. Why not learn how to make videos? Why not learn how to use Photoshop? Why not learn how to, um, figure out SEO, that's kind of a necessity. So you end up learning a lot of related uh, technology and other skill sets that come with being a producer. Uh, but yeah, I I didn't have it figured out. I, I, uh, <laughs> I just kind of pieced it all together and here I am. I guess you figured things out along the way, like by try, trying new things. But I mean, even your first YouTube video was what, like 15 years ago? Yeah, and the first YouTube video was never meant to be for the the masses. That was I was working with high schoolers at the time. Uh, I was okay. teaching them. Yeah, I was teaching them multimedia. So the program that the um, the 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 course I I was teaching focused on was Sony Acid. They don't I don't think they teach that anymore. Yeah, I understand why, but I'm still <laughs> stuck with it. So I I made that video for my students to use as a review tool in between 
the times that I that I would see them so that they wouldn't forget. Right. Um, and I figured I just I put it on YouTube because they had internet access, and I made it public in case it it could be of some help to other people. And I guess it was so. Yeah. Yeah. Those early videos they were like some of the first production tutorials on YouTube, I think. And me and if this is any any indication of how little I had things figured out, I should have seen the response to those and thought, <laughs> hmm, I'm feeling a, a need here. I, I'm yeah. there's a niche for this kind of content. But instead I was like, uh, I'll make another one when I feel like it. So, you know, <laughs> five years later I, I make another one and I've just completely dropped the ball because all these other producers rushed in to fill that vacuum and did a way better job than I did. And I don't I don't think there was I can't think of anyone that was doing tutorials back then. I know like, Busy Works Beats has been doing them for a long time. I can't mm-hmm. remember when his first video was, but the only production videos I remember from back then, I can't remember when he started doing them, but when Ryan Leslie used to do his like cook up videos, it wasn't like a tutorial as such, but that was like the earliest thing I can remember, which is close to a production tutorial. Yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of beat making videos and and by a lot, I mean, you know, hundreds now there are yeah. probably millions. Right. Oh, definitely. Man, I was impressed by your um, video editing skills, though. I watched the the first ever one right at the end when you kind of click your fingers and just vanish off into the thin air. <laughs> yeah, that was, again, that was for the students because <laughs> yeah. that was something that I had taught them how to do with videography because that was also a component of the multimedia yeah. um, course that I was, that I was um, teaching. So, you know, Teaching entails a lot of learning and it was a it was a fun it was a fun program to work for back when I did. Of course, yeah. Well with that being so you were teaching maybe fifteen years ago, but when did you actually start producing? Long time ago. Very long time <laughs> ago. Uh I actually uh <laughs> reconnected with the guy in whose apartment I made my first beat. So I was a kid. I was a very yeah. young kid and it was just kind of a fun thing for me because I love music and I never in a million years thought I could create music or even, you know, be, become a DJ or anything like that. But I always yeah. wanted to, it just seemed like such a confusing and mystical process in this kind of secret society of, yeah. of creatives. And I remember the first time opening FL studio and just being like, what is this? all the different dials you could change. I thought I'd never be able to figure it out. What version did you start with? Um, Man, I can't even remember. I'd say the first time I ever made a beat was probably like 10 years ago. But I've probably So it was called been... FL Studio by then? I think it was... I remember seeing it back when it was called Fruity Loops. I don't know if I was using it then because I had some of my boys that were producing and I used to watch them making beats and I'm pretty sure when they were making beats, it was called Fruity Loops. So a long time yeah. ago. Fruity Loops, man. Yeah, that was, that was just a program that you didn't, you didn't brag about back then. And now yeah. it's like people are getting FL chains and tattoos and stuff. And back then <laughs> you, just kind of, you felt kind of childish saying, yeah, I use Fruity Loops because it sounds like a kid's cereal. Yeah, yeah, it didn't didn't sound the and most now professional, did it? Nah, and now it's industry standard. Yeah. But it was kind of cool, like, if you were the Ninth Wonder sort of guy right. back then, where it was like, yeah, you're shifting the narrative now, you're changing the paradigm. Suddenly, DAWs are valid, look what I'm making, and I'm saying Fruity Loops. Yeah. And I dare I dare you to question my, <laughs> my talent as a producer, because I just did a record with Jay-Z, so... Yeah. Fruity Loops, there, there you have. And then they changed it to FL Studio, and then people were kind of like, yeah, I use FL, FL Gang. It, it just sounds a little more mature and sophisticated than Fruity Loops. But I, I'm sure the the intent of the Fruity Loops program wasn't necessarily to become the industry standard digital audio workstation, and yet it's one of them. No, it seemed like they were kind of focusing on ease of use, maybe, because everything was just laid out so like neat. Like it looked, it looked more welcoming back then compared to other software programs. Yeah, because it was just a step sequencer. It was like, um, well, it was, I shouldn't say just a step sequencer. It was, yeah, 
it was a step sequencer that went beyond, but the interface at its core was was I think they even modeled it and and they openly advertised it as the digital uh emulation of like a 404 or something like that. Ah, uh, okay. That makes sense. Have you ever thought about changing or did you ever try and change softwares? I mean, I, I guess when you get to a certain point when you've used something for so long, it's kind of pointless changing because if you know how to get the job done, it doesn't really matter. But have you ever thought about changing? No, it did matters. Try? <laughs> oh, God. Every day of my life. Really? Every day of my life. On it. Yeah, my, my program is just getting insufferable. But I didn't I didn't start using what I use now. I started just experimenting. You know, I was using anything I could find. Yeah. Really, really, literally anything I could find. If it was an 8 track, 12 track, I'd find a way. If it was um, Cool Edit Pro, I'd find a way. If yeah. it was, um, I mean, there were, the one program that I couldn't figure out was, um, it was the precursor to Reason um, by Propeller Heads. It was called, like, I can't remember. What was it called? I definitely man? tried cool edit. I remember that one, but I can't remember the the reason one you mentioned. In. I remember reason, but I don't know if there was a different version. Yeah, this was before. I got to look it up now. Um, I got to figure this out. This is going to bother me. Um, this is from way back, way back. Was it Recycle? No, I don't think so. No, no, no. There was one called Cape Walk. Rebirth, maybe? Could be. It's not something that I've used, though. It was, I mean, it was old. I know Cakewalk. Cakewalk, um, Cakewalk was different. You know, back then, there, there weren't really these all-in-ones. Yeah. It was like you used Pro Tools if you were an engineer, and you used... Um, software, you, you had a motif or you had a MPC or whatever, if you made beats and, and, right. then, and then if you were, um, uh, if you were a all around producer, then you had to have a sequencer and you had to use all these other things. If you were a composer, you would use Cubase or, um, what, what was it called? Nuendo. There was another one that was for scoring. Yeah. And now you just do it all. You know, if you have logic, you can do it all. If you have FL, Pro Tools, Ableton, whatever, you do it all. Yeah. It seems like there's a weird thing about what DAW people are using right now as well. Like you said, it's FL Gang or people that use Logic say that Logic's better. Um, I don't know why there's always this fight. I think there was a DCAP video where he was... I think people were saying that Logic produced like a different sound. Like when you bounce something to Logic, it sounded different to FL. And I think it was decap. I could be wrong, but he made a video where he compared the two, and they just sounded exactly the same. So I don't think there's any mm. actually. There's, there's no change in the way that they export the sounds. There's no like different output. They all do the same stuff, really. They might just have different layouts or different stop plugins, but I think they still do the same thing. I've thought about that because I've heard so many different uh, takes on that. Where there were there are people that were, that swear FL processes audio different, yeah, and uh, differently. But yeah, I, have, I haven't heard that about anything else. I haven't heard anything about. Uh, I've I've never been told that my DAW sounds a, a specific way. I've never heard that about Ableton or Logic. I've just I've heard it about FL, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's just a FL ego, FL user ego. We were fed up of all the Fruity Loop stuff back in the day, and now, now that we're official with FL, this is our way of saying it. <laughs> well, I, th I don't know. I always thought FL did process audio hotter than any other DAW, but I think it also just might be that people who use FL often are using similar resources, similar sounds, yeah. and FL comes with a lot of stock plugins that will increase the loudness of a track. And so it's kind of encouraged. I don't know. Yeah. I, I, especially that's, the that's my theory, clipper. but I, yeah, like the few, the fruity soft clipper. And then what's the, the limiter that you, that FL has, um, I guess it's just, just fruity limiter. 
Yeah, Fruity Limited. There, there are just so many stock plugins that allow you to just kind of push it to the max. Make loud ass music. Yeah, yeah. And so that was always, you know, I'd hear, I'd hear beats that my friends would make in FL. I'm like, why is this so loud? This, <laughs> why can't I get my stuff to sound this loud? And it's just because I wasn't, well, I, I could, I just wasn't taking the same steps that they were. Yeah. It feels like for a long time, there's been this thing where people have kind of separated industry producers from online or YouTube producers, but it seems like you've managed to cover both ends. Like you have a long list of credits from like well-known rappers as well, some legends in the game, and you've managed to do stuff online as well with a YouTube channel, with type beats, selling beats online. So how have you managed to kind of cut through and, and do both sides of it? I think that was just always a myth. And one of the one of the dumber myths, yeah. Uh, so I, I just don't even think it was real, ever. I mean, to to separate the internet from the music business when, since Napster, the internet has run the music business. Yeah, is just counterintuitive, um, and that's a euphemism for incredibly stupid because it's just, it doesn't make sense. So, yeah, I, I, anyone still having that conversation today, especially after like Old Town Road, right, is just not, I don't know where their, their heads are. They've, something happened to them. Something <laughs> awful happened to them. No, 100%. That makes sense. I feel like maybe it was just a couple of people that said it, or sometimes you might get, a producer with an ego or someone that's maybe jealous of someone that's made some money online and then they start saying things oh, or yeah. like throwing these names out like oh he's in he's a youtube producer you know trying to like throw shade on them but like you mm -hmm. said it's never been a thing like it just doesn't make sense no. does it it's like just because you've uploaded your beat somewhere it doesn't mean you're any different to someone that hasn't uploaded a beat somewhere it's just it's crazy no and i i believe that way back to, yeah you know because the internet, you, you just kind of want to feel like you're in a better position than someone else to kind of yeah. justify. Because there's there's so much doubt involved, and I'm not excusing it, but there's so much doubt involved in pursuing a, a music career, especially as a producer. Right. Um, and you know you, you you're feeling like you're at the at the bottom of the hierarchy in the music business. So sometimes you just want to feel like you're above someone else. So yeah. How can how can I you know back when I don't know back back when I was working three jobs and going to school and trying to make music work for myself how and I'm frustrated because I I am really not making money off of music even though I have placements right you know place album placements are one thing I didn't have hit singles you know I, like, I think people think because because you have a plaque you're a millionaire and it's yeah. not true I was making like thirty six thousand dollars a year or something but the 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 fact of the matter is I was feeling like I needed to, I guess, assert my talent or prove myself or something. I had a chip mm. on my shoulder because I, I was insecure about everything. Um, you know, my career wasn't going out, going the way I wanted it to. And so how do I feel superior? Oh, well, I'm, I'm in the industry. I'm not one of these internet guys. I'm yeah. not selling 24 99 leases. And it's like, they were making more music than me. They were reaching more ears than me. They were doing better uh, brand building and they were making more money right? than I was. So, you know, whoever was putting out that narrative that um, the internet was somehow a lesser space than the, the traditional music industry, it was appealing to me yeah. um, as someone who was just trying to figure it all out for myself. So I, I feel terrible. Um, and I think the consequences of that, in addition to, to me just looking stupid and, and looking like a jerk, um, is that I missed out on a lot of the wave of, um, you know, it, it being a, a independent producer and that, that first wave of online beat maker entrepreneurship that really set some amazing precedents for people. Yeah. Um, you know, when you consider some of like, e even, I don't even know 
what what the first wave was technically like soul eternity or whatever but when things really took off it was um what is that group called? was it called hit hits committee with with um, superstar o and vibe and johnny Giuliano oh my, and all them oh uh, man well i know they're called team hits now but it, or yeah, team hits yeah team yeah hits, sorry yeah. team hits yeah like that era right um they defined a whole sound i mean I, you can't take anything away from them. It, it wasn't. It wasn't just that they were making money selling beats online. It was that they inspired an entire generation of producers to be yeah. independent, and they they made great music that was uh, that was unique to them and to their brands and to their movements. So, hundred percent. I missed out on that because I was I was being stupid. I mean, Cash Money AP is a prime example of someone who's been able to do something like starting off with tight beats to owning a record label. It's huge. Yeah, and I definitely took a page out of his book too um, and just said, you know what? I'm just going to be as prolific as possible. Yeah. And uh, he was, if, if Cash Money AP can upload a beat every single day, so can I. Right. So let's see. let's see what happens. And I think I started doing that. I think I started doing that after I met him. I was just like, eh, if he can do it, let me try to do it. Yeah. And so I, that's what I've been doing. What? So when did you start uploading a beat per day? Do you remember how far back that was? Probably between two and three years. Right. And did you, ha did you have a game like plan then? Were you thinking, right, I'm going to stick to one niche. Am I going to do one artist? Were you, were you think, even thinking about tags then, or were you just uploading beats? Uh, the the thing about that was, this was me dropping the ball again. <laughs> so with with Beat Stars, that was that was my introduction. So I'm I was late to the online beat leasing space. Right. So when I when when Mike Trampy and Abe finally convinced me to join Beat Stars, I still wasn't a believer, you know, because I put the beats on. Yeah. And I only put like 10, 12 beats on. So I'm like, I'm not, I'm not making $10,000 a month. This is, <laughs> this, this isn't real. Uh, but I would, I would upload beat again. I would upload beats to YouTube and the videos would kind of take off and I'm, I'm taking all of this for granted. I'm like hundred thousand views on this beat. Eh. And I it didn't matter what kind of beat I was uploading. And this was yeah. like 2016 YouTube was still kind of democratic where I could upload any kind of beat I wanted. And as long as the title was um, searchable, people were going to find it. Right. And my views were up. And, you know, fast forward to now, I don't know what's going on with YouTube. I I've, I want to throw YouTube out the window along <laughs> with my DAW. Uh, it, it's so frustrating. But, yeah, it... Um, I didn't need to have a plan back then. I, I could just kind of do whatever I wanted. And, and yeah. for me, I like making all kinds of beats. So that's a, a blessing and a curse. Um, yeah, but these days I try to definitely be more focused, but it's still something that I'm trying to figure out because the, the algorithm changes all the time. Right. And my channel has never really been that focused, which is my fault. And so I'm, I'm trying to salvage and and see you know what is working and that's that's changing because youtube is always changing so i'm, I'm just kind of trying to play catch up and experiment a little right see, see what keywords work yeah i mean it seemed like back then keywords were everything like you said you could have the right keywords and then you could rank but now now keywords i feel like they might, they might matter to some extent but for example, if I search something on YouTube and you search something on YouTube, we're going to have different results anyway. So how do you rank for yeah. something when everyone has different search results? And what I'm kind of figuring out now is the most important thing is like watch time, I'd say. Yeah. To me anyway, that's oh, yeah. what I've found. If the watch time's high, then the video ends up getting recommended to other people. YouTube even say that when you upload a video. If your watch time's high, they start recommending it. So surely that's got to be the, the main factor. So if you could somehow keep people engaged on YouTube, whether it's just the beats just crazy or 
you know, the, the tutorials like really in depth or whatever it is to keep people engaged. That's going to be the thing that matters more than the like tags. Maybe the thumbnail helps. I'd say click through rate definitely helps and average watch time. They're like some of the main things that I'll focus on personally anyway. It seems like that's where it's gone. Yeah, I think it's all of those things filtered through a mysterious, ever-changing algorithm. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, how do we how do we figure that out as an end user? I think um, I think we're all just guessing, and it works for some of us, and, and the rest of us just have to scramble to keep up. Definitely. I mean, you say the way you speak sometimes is like your channel hasn't got to the position it's in now. I mean, you've hit a hundred K subscribers, you've got a plaque. It's still like something, it's still a good accomplishment. It's still something to be proud of, you know? So although you might not have done like yeah. the traditional route of just uploading beats or just doing tutorials, like you still managed to grow a huge audience that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as frustrated as I am with YouTube, it's not as though I'm going to stop using the platform. Yeah. It's just, it's uh, really not transparent. Yeah. And so it's a lot of guesswork and a lot of experimenting. And I'm going to keep experimenting, um, but I'm experimenting with all kinds of platforms. You know, it's, there are so many other options out there. What well, are you using at the moment? Oh, uh, man, you name it. I mean, name a platform. I'm, I'm trying to TikTok, Audio Mac, whatever. I'm, yeah. I'm putting content. Nice. Have you got a, a Discord as well? I don't have a Discord. That Discord is a lot of work. Yeah, to run. I have an I have an account on Discord, but I'm not super active. Yeah, Discord is one of those things where you need to be active in there, or at least have staff like mods that are going to run it for you and be active with everyone. It, it is a lot of work. Um, luckily, I have some people in mind that kind of like run it and help out with beat battles and things. So it kind of takes the, the weight off my shoulders. But yeah, I mean, um, it's a good platform for engaging with the community. I don't know if it's, well, I haven't been on it long enough to know if it's an amazing platform for growth, for brand growth, because I don't know like, how it works. I don't know how it gets recommended to people. I feel like Discord's a thing where you already have to have an audience to send people there. Cause I don't know how people just find new Discord platforms or new Discord servers. I'm sure there's a way. But it's not like YouTube where people are just typing in and just finding things. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. But so, then again, this is coming from someone who doesn't really know how Discord works. What is that? Right. There's fuzz on my headphones. <laughs> so one thing that I noticed you post, a f I think it was a few weeks back. It was one of your recent Instagram posts. You said something about producers taking bad deals and... I won't be quoting this perfectly, but you said something like if producers stopped agreeing or accepting bad deals, then, you know, they, they'd help out all the other producers or we'd all benefit, you know? So what kind of bad deals were you talking about? Could you give some examples of a bad deal or maybe a common bad deal that you see a producer taking? Bad deals come in all shapes and sizes. I, I think uh, the the main factor in all of this is, and this applies to anybody, obviously we're speaking to, to producers right now, but yeah. just accepting a deal, signing a deal without fully understanding what it means, what every right. deal point actually involves. And a lot of that comes from us being naive. And, you know, of course that's not an excuse because we know that the music business is a, a little, exploitative yeah we we all know that we we've seen the movies you know they dramatize them and i think most people who aren't actually in the music business who who speak on the music business or have opinions on the music business yeah they make it out to be a lot worse than it is but what blows my mind is given how you know we've seen these over dramatized critiques of music industry horror stories like the yeah. nwa movie or the tlc movie or you know all the dame ritter hate because of the hobson song <laughs> and which is trash but whatever um and still when people are presented with an agreement or a scam you know even when they yeah. get an email saying hey this is def jam records and def jam is misspelled send us a thousand dollars and we're going to sign you right 
suddenly all that goes out the window and they're like, yeah, I'm going to sign. So they don't, they don't get a lawyer. They don't consult a manager. They don't, they don't even DM another producer and like, Hey, can, can you give me some advice on this? They yeah. just sign. And then after the fact, they contact someone. I get DMs all the time from people saying, Hey, can you look over this contract I just signed? And it's like, no, you signed it. There's nothing. I, number one, no, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving you free legal services. Right. Cause I'm not even qualified to, and, and I wouldn't do that anyway. Cause come on, but you already signed it. And I've seen some of these deals where I'm like, you know, right here in plain English, this deal says that you signed and agreed to, you're never getting paid off this. Yeah. Why would you sign that? Well, I asked my aunt and I asked my <laughs> cousin, or like, is your aunt a lawyer? No, but you know, she works at a bank. It's like, where? Do you... <laughs> Come on, guys. Right. You got to protect yourselves. And, um, if the, it, it, cause, cause the thing is, it's a domino effect. If, if, if this artist or this manager over here gets over on a producer and gets an exclusive all in buyout for a hundred dollars, they're going to come to me and say, yeah, um, we want an exclusive, uh, zero publishing. We're, we want to buy it out. You don't get yeah. anything, no royalties, nothing. And we're going to give you a hundred dollars. I'm going to look at them like they're absolutely crazy. Because I come from ten thousand dollar advances and fifty fifty underlying composition splits, right? Other producers might not, and so they'll accept this scam of a deal, and then that what happens is that pollutes the communal well of all producers. Because if they can get over on you, they think they can get over on me, right. and if they think they can get over on me, they think they can get over on any one of us. Which isn't necessarily the case at all, you know, but then I have to go, you just pass the buck on to me because you created a bad situation for yourself. And now I have to deal with the fallout. I have to deal with people saying, you know, well, my, this other artist I know gets beats for $15 from such and such a producer, all in buyout. Um, I'm like, well, I'm not doing that. Oh, well, you're just acting Hollywood. You Okay, cool. Yeah. Go elsewhere then. But I, I, it's just, at, at, at best, it's a waste of my time to even have these conversations. And at worst, it's a poison that affects a lot of people. When you have a bunch of naive people conducting business, um, it, it, you're, we're all on the same boat and you're just poking holes in the ship. And we're, we're going to sink together, you know, to an extent. Some of right. us have bigger lifeboats than others, but regardless, we have to deal with it as a, as a collective. So I, yeah. I think ironically and counterintuitively, some of the, so the best thing a lot of us can do is just be more selfish, yeah. you know, because if we're more selfish, if I'm like, I'm never taking a buyout deal and I'm not, I'm not, ta there's no way I'm accepting this bad deal. Yeah. At, at very least, that person isn't going to think, okay, I got over on pain and I'm going to get over on everyone else. It's going to be a situation where they have to rethink their approach and their offers. So if if I'm one of you know the 5%, 10%, 20% of producers standing up for myself, oh, well, 80%, we're outnumbered. But if 80% right. of producers are standing up for themselves – that's going to help the 20% of the producers that are too ignorant and too ex inexperienced to know better. So if I'm standing up for myself and you're standing up for yourself mm -hmm. and a hundred thousand other producers are standing up for yourself, the guy that just started making beats or um, the woman that just started making beats or the non-binary person that just started making beats, whoever they are, they're going to benefit from that because we already cut out all the bullshit for you. Yeah. So, People aren't going to feel emboldened to come to you with a terrible deal. They're going to have to watch themselves and they're going to have to make a, a fairer offer to you. So that that's what I meant by that tweet. And it's frustrating to see people argue because a lot of producers are out there spread. It, it produces our, our own worst enemy. Right. You know, from the, from the person advertising, I'll remake any YouTube beat for $150 to the people in the that, yeah. forums saying when you when you sell a beat exclusively you get nothing you give up all your royalties all of that is a lie yeah and people people will go on the internet 
and lie and speak on the music business when they've never been in the music business a day in their lives just to get likes, just to get upvotes, just to get that viral moment, just to be a part of the conversation because people would rather hear themselves speak. Some people would. Yeah. Um, ignorant people, harmful, toxic people would rather hear themselves speak and say the wrong thing than just listen and not insert themselves into a conversation that they have no business being in. Right. Yeah. I mean, people will find something, they'll hear one person say something and it could be a completely unreliable source. It could just be anyone that has just made like one beat and they've just sent this information out about music business and royalties and everything. Someone else takes that information and they repost it and then models it up until the, in, into their own words. And then they regurgitate it out on their own platform. And it just spreads like wildfire, all this false information. And it's crazy. I think sometimes it's, well, even- yeah, it, it's like, um, you know, sorry to cut you off. It's, it's, it's like you, the adult table versus the kid table right. at Thanksgiving. You, you have the kid table over there so they can talk about kid shit. Yeah. I don't necessarily want to talk about my IRA with a four-year-old. Right. You know, the four-year-old isn't going to give me any information. They're just going to interrupt and say, why don't you put more, <laughs> put $5 million in your IRA? <laughs> like that's not because I don't have $5 million. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to talk about the current structure and the difference between a Roth and the SEP IRA. Yeah. You don't even know what IRA stands for. <laughs> Go back to the kid table. Th- that's how I feel about these conversations online where no, it's you're like, right. <laughs> you're telling me about deal points and you've never signed a deal. And you're arguing with people that actually have many, many, many deals under their belt? Yeah. What? <laughs> Why? Why are you wasting your... You could learn from this conversation if you would just shut up and listen. You know, and, and I think people are afraid to look ignorant and they're afraid to yeah. um, to be silent, which is weird to me. They, they want to be talking because the internet encourages content, content, content. But it's like produce the content that you're comfortable with if you don't know anything about the music business don't make music business content yeah if all you want to if if your only experience in the music business is making music then make music and let that be the content let that be the core of your content right but you got people giving legal advice and they're not lawyers and they've never even signed a deal you have people advising other producers on how to do a b and c and they're selling a course on how to do a b and c and they've not ever done those things themselves and so you just have a a mess of a situation right now and that's 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 where we are now um and so the good news is by standing out you know by actually learning and um by listening and by just being a more thoughtful player in this game that that's actually going to be a major asset because you're going to stand out from from the rest of the, the folks out there that are just trying to, to to scream over the white noise 100 percent. and people might think that they don't know who to trust because so many people are, are giving out different bits of information but at the same time it's not hard to research someone so if you are hearing information from let's say just any producer on instagram it takes two seconds to search their name and you can see if, if they've had any deals you can see if they've if they're with a label or if they've got credits you know like you, you can see instantly if they've been through that stuff so that should be a starting point, really. If you're going to take information from someone, then, then just do some research and figure out if it's no. if you're going to be taking that information from someone reliable. And don't always just don't don't let that that person be your single source. Yeah, you know, I'm speaking from my heart and my experience right now, but my experience doesn't apply to everybody either. And there are different kinds of deals out there. There are different kinds of situations out there. Um, and you know, I'm, I might, I might make a statement that's factual, but it's not all inclusive. So don't, don't, don't let me be your single source. Right. I mean, um, there, there are just, cause, cause where did I get my information? I didn't get it for myself. I've I've been to a million (laughs) different conferences. I've read books, I've read websites, governmental websites, talk to lawyers, talk to managers, talk to other artists, experience this all myself mm. year after year after year. So I'm getting this all from different sources. Yeah. And there, there are questions that I still have, and I want to go straight to an authoritative source and then cross-reference that material with other sources and then right. make a determination from there. Cause you know, sometimes people present the same information, just they word it differently. And 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's always, it's always better to feel confident because people misconstrue stuff too. They'll misquote something, you know, like you'll, you'll, I think the biggest misunderstanding is recoupment. You know, someone says I had to recoup my, my royalties and someone replaces recoup with repay. And then they spread that around the internet. And now people are a hundred percent positive that one narrative is, is correct. And the other one isn't, it doesn't matter what you say. You yeah. Know, Cause that's the information that they, that they're married to now. Cause they have a personal connection with, with that and they want to be right. And it's like being right. Isn't, isn't going to benefit you if, if the information you have isn't factual. Right. So I don't, I don't know what the point of all that is. It's, it seems like a waste of energy. Yeah, well, like you said, people like the voice to be heard and the internet, social media just gives everyone a platform for them to be heard. So like you said, people would rather get the likes than just admit that they might not know certain topics and they need to do the research and study it themselves before they share that information because it's easy to hop on a platform and just say anything, just hoping that someone will listen and then start a reaction in a Instagram post or where, wherever it might be. But I and think journalists we- are doing the same thing. That's the sad part. And yeah. And- not just, you know, people that run their own blogger account. I'm, I'm like talking about people that are getting their, their information published in Rolling Stone and all these, because right. magazines and, and these publications, they were never meant for, uh, they, they, they weren't meant as, I guess, sources of some of the, the more hardcore music business talk yeah because that's not that's not interesting to the average listener they want to hear about you know who justin bieber is having sex with that's that they don't want to hear about um royalty rates right and if they do want to hear about royalty rates then you have to make it palatable and digestible to a person who knows nothing about the music business. Yeah. And now you're entering into kind of dangerous territory because, because you're talking about pretty important legal stuff, but you're dumbing it down. And in doing so, you might get it wrong because you as a journalist aren't a lawyer. You as a journalist aren't necessarily someone who's experienced any of this stuff firsthand. So you're trying to translate music business speak to, um, uh, you know, popular culture speak. Yeah. And that, that is, that can be dangerous because people get the wrong idea. Definitely. And they'll translate it into like, whenever you see a news article, like all journalists do it, all newspapers do it, like any news source does it, but the tactic is to scare people. So whenever you scare someone, it attracts them. So whatever information they hear, even if it's just way off, they'll just, kind of reword it into a title that's going to scare someone. So they're like, oh my God, that rapper got done out of $1 million yeah. for this deal. Let me pick it up and read it. That, and then it's just completely wrong information. But like you said, then people take that and then feed it back to everyone else. But it's the scare yeah, type. Yeah, it happened that with Old Town with. Road. Yeah. It happened with Old Town Road. Everyone was saying they were, they were getting sued by Trent Reznor and no, that, that wasn't the case. Right. Um, all you had to do was go to, you know, Young Kios, um Twitter and he's like, I don't know, what are you talking about? Or or the Nick Mirror yeah. situation with Sting. Um, yeah, it, there was just reporting that was way more blood than than fact. Yeah, and the blood was more interesting. You know, thinking right, this kid's being sued because this viral hit. There was something dark, and, yeah, and ugly oozing out from under the surface, and um, you know, Nick Mira didn't clear the sample and made all these mistakes and ha ha, let's laugh at him. And none of that was true. Right. They just wanted to make it look like uh, uh, they wanted to add that Hollywood touch. They wanted to add the the sex appeal. They wanted to add the, you know, the, the drama, the histrionics. It, and it's, it's sad that people still believe all that, but right. You'd think that's that's the world. You'd think at this day, after seeing so many bits of information being misinterpreted, you'd think, yeah, you'd think that people would now question things, but sadly not. 
But um, just going back to, to bad deals really quick. What about, let me throw, maybe I'll throw a scenario at you. So think about, let's say uh, we have a, a new producer who is going to get his first placement and it's with a fairly big artist. He's thinking it's a chance for him to get a credit under his portfolio. He's thinking I'll do anything to get this credit, but they're throwing a bad deal his way. So let's say, let's say it's not a terrible deal. Let's say they're not willing to pay anything up front. He'll get some publishing. Um, and that's about it. He's not getting any producer points, no money on the revenue side, but he'll still have some publishing. Would you consider that a bad deal for a new producer, considering that they're going to get their share of publishing, but no money up front and no money on like the, the other side of it? Yeah, it's a terrible deal because when you look at how, and this is a problem too, ask, ask the average music maker what a streaming royalty is and right. ask them what it's worth. They're, they're going to spout off what they've read in a Rolling Stone article about yeah. Spotify royalties. They're going to say, oh, it's about four cents a stream or something like that. Yeah. And the way that we speak about that implies that there's such thing as this single unified streaming royalty. There's not. Right. There's no such thing as a streaming royalty. There's never been such thing as a streaming royalty. Yeah. It's the biggest, one of the biggest lies being spread nowadays in the music business. Yeah. There is no such, you will never get a check that says, here's your streaming royalty check. Right. You will get five different checks that all make up a single, um, a, a single streaming royalty. And these are royalties that have been around for decades. Mechanicals, for example, those yeah. referred to player pianos. Now they've been adapted to, to the streaming world. Doesn't make sense, does it? But that's how it is. Um, people also think that um, that publishing makes a ton of money. But when you look at how streaming has broken down, l let's let's consider this for a second. Okay. Remember Napster and all that stuff with the internet. Right. Um, versus the music industry. Remember how, how to this day, you know, people are saying Napster and the MP3 destroyed the music business. Yeah. No, no, it didn't. What happened was the music business did drag its, its feet a lot. All the labels, you know, they attacked Napster. They hated Napster. Yeah. Now they're all in bed with the streaming platforms. They all right. have deals. Every streaming platform has deals with these major labels. And, and this isn't a conspiracy theory. Any this is anything. This is just how it works. Yeah. Um, they have they have deals with YouTube Music. They have deals with Apple Music. Now the majority. This is what happens with the labels. When you sign to a label, they own your masters. That's that's how it is. Ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time. Yeah. Um, and so, who do you think a stream tends to benefit the most? whoever owns the masters that's 56% around 56% of a streaming royalty so if a streaming royalty is worth 4.4 cents and we can't even say that cuz it varies so much right. it depends on what kind of stream what time of day it is what kind of what kind of user it is, what kind of account yeah there are all these factors so people who have these conversations like they know they just they're they're full of shit yeah uh so but let's just say you know, let's let's say a, a, a streaming royalty is worth four cents, right? The label is getting almost three cents of that. Yeah. Which leaves one cent to be divided among whoever owns the publishing and whoever, you know, who's that, whoever is getting the performance royalties, the, um, the, the mechanicals. Uh, maybe there's some YouTube monetization involved in that, but it's, right. it's the minority share. So what you'll hear these days now is, you know, like you said, this, this deal, this offer is something that a lot of people have offered me as a producer. Like, well, I'll give you, you know, I'm, I'm going to own the master, but you're going to get the, um, the, pub, you know, half of the publishing. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but, that's 0%. Even if you gave me half of the master, my guess is you're probably not even going to generate any money off of that because most songs don't generate much money right. on the platforms. So yeah, I, I, I'm not telling producers to be unreasonable and, and ask for a ton of money up front. 
you know, ask for something fair for both parties, but someone's, someone's purchasing a product from you. They're licensing intellectual property from you. Yeah. So that, that has some value to it and you, you should act as though it has some kind of value. Uh, and, and, and also understand what all of these, uh, revenue streams, all these royalty streams really mean where they come from, so on and so forth. A lot of people just don't know. And the yeah. more, you know, the clearer it becomes, and then you can walk into a situation knowing enough to make that determination yourself. Cause there, yeah, there are cases where say there's an artist that's getting on average, you know, 2 million streams a song and they say, yeah, I, I want a beat from you. Okay, cool. I'm not going to charge you for the beat. Um, just cut me in on everything. We'll just do right. 50, 50. I don't care. Um, that's fine. You know, cause, cause I know I'm going to get that money back, but I know exactly how I'm going to get that money back. Yeah. With a label, it's different. I'm not giving a label anything for free cause they're going to try to, they're, they're, they're going to own my masters. So I'm not giving you my master copyright for nothing. Right. Like you're you give me an advance. You're going to get that money back. That's what recoupment is. And we, we keep it moving. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Yeah. I think the reason I was asking is because some people might think that they could do a lot more with that credit. Even if they take the hit up front, they might be like, okay, well, I've got yeah. that credit and that's going to give me leverage when it comes to the next one, you know? Let me tell you two things. One, people think that the back end, which is another one of those problematic terms, because it doesn't really mean anything. It can yeah. refer to a bunch of different income streams people act like the back end is this big thing and oh i'll take a hit up front just to get the back end right no get money up front and then get the back end don't, don't be an idiot and then number two um what was the other thing you said uh um well oh, oh, people oh yeah people the... people yeah yeah people think if they take a hit now they'll have more opportunities later yeah because of the credit because of that think of think of how think of how incredibly I, I'm I'm sorry I'm being so harsh. No, Think how incredibly good. stupid this would sound if we applied it to to dating, right? right? Like, <laughs> I'm gonna let I'm gonna let this person move in with me and not pay rent for the first six months, yeah, so that I look good, and then the following six months I'll ask them to pay rent. They're not gonna pay rent the following six months right. because you set a precedent. Yeah. Now the trend is that you're paying rent and they're not paying a, anything. They're not contributing. So when month seven comes around and you walk up to them and you're all stammering, you're like, hey, I think we need to talk about rent. <laughs> They're going to laugh at you. Yeah. So same with, with, I have all these producers contact me like, yeah, this artist wants to beat for free, but I don't want to burn a bridge. So I think I'm going to take it so that I can continue this working relationship with them. Right. What kind of relationship is this? Yeah. This relationship is based on you getting screwed. Of course. You want to continue a relationship of you getting screwed? You don't want to burn a bridge? What kind of bridge is this? Yeah. This isn't the kind of bridge you want to cross. No. Make the bridge better. Yeah. There's, there's, and, and if, if you bringing up a conversation about fairness and about, and, and you bringing up a conversation about negotiating terms, if, if that, makes the other person not want to work with you, then you shouldn't be working with that person. They're right. a bad person. Yeah. And I suppose once you've done something for free the first time, it's going to be so much harder to try and charge them the next time. Cause like you said, you've already set that level. You've already said that I'm working for free. So then the next time, how are you going to charge them then? Cause like you said, they're just going to laugh at you. And what's the point of having those kind of relationships? It's like, if someone's yeah. just gone out of the way to make sure that you're not getting paid, they obviously don't really care that much about you. But then at the same yeah. time, you're working so hard to try and keep that relationship when it isn't a healthy relationship. So, no, I think it makes sense. Yeah, that said, no, you, you, you look like somebody that's just asking to be taken advantage of. Yeah. Don't, you don't want to be that person, so don't be that person. Of course. What would you say some of the mistakes that you see new producers making? For example, like producers tend to be quite impatient when they get started. Um, but do you, do you see some of the common mistakes? I think impatience is a huge mistake. Yeah. 
because uh, that can lead to so much. Right. Yeah, I, I think um, being impatient, um, really focusing on money yeah, as the metric, you know, um, I guess it's a metric, but money comes with better music better brand building right um better content so a lot of people end up focusing just on the fact that they haven't made a ton of money and it's like i don't i don't know who who told you that being a musician <laughs> meant making instant fast right. money i don't whoever told you that you probably saw it in one of those ke on the track youtube ads or something but it's not true <laughs> Um, so you, you got to put the work in and, and I hear that a lot from producers. Like I've been making beats for six months yeah, and I haven't sold more than three beats. And it's like, I bet you tell them to go yeah, six on your YouTube channel and time. scroll the way back to the beginning and be like, this is, this is, I, yeah, I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's like, why, what do you tell people? Because it, it's, it's so odd, this space that we're in. Right. Um, because no one would go to college for a four year degree and say, Man, I've been in, in this school for two years and I still don't have my bachelor's. What's yeah. going on? This is bullshit. Or, you know, I, I uh I don't know, I I invested two hundred thousand dollars in real estate and I haven't made a million yet. Like that doesn't happen really, I don't think. But in music, the expectation is is fast money, yeah, and uh, and and minimal work and minimal knowledge. So I, I think, um, yeah, I think the mistake I made, as you said, really just relying on the music and putting all your eggs into that basket and not learning the landscape, not learning about multiple revenue streams, not learning right. about, um, not having a, a an overall strategy. That's multi prong. A lot of producers, it's like st step one, make beats. Step two, make money. And it's like, yeah, that that might work one percent of the time. Yeah. Um, but if you really want to be smart about it, figure out all the different revenue streams, and 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 figure out your own revenue model. And then you know, on top of that, just make great music. You know, if, if your focus is this is a labor of love. This is a creative uh, career. If your focus is just on the money, you're going to burn yourself out really fast. Definitely. Because you'll be disappointed really fast. Because with music, exactly. it's not one of those things where there's a, a clear structure. Everyone's got a different story. Everyone got to a certain stage at a, a different point in life. It's not like there's a set path where you do this course and by the end of it, you'll be on a 20K wage to start off with and then after two years you'll be on this like there's just no clear path for anyone so it's confusing when well life think, in general doesn't work that way right there's, there you know I, I can't name a profession that's guaranteed yeah you know people go to college for years and years and then they get out and they're unemployed for a long stretch of time or they or they take a job that they didn't initially want or you know they have to to uh, you know, intern. I, I don't know. It, it's just life isn't isn't that straightforward. It's it's never been that straightforward, right? Because even when when you look at careers, like if you research a career online, it, it will say you can earn this much or you could earn this much. It's never you will earn this much. It's like they're, they're basing that off what people have done or what people are currently doing. You know, but it's not like that's the set path for everyone. So it is confusing when people think there's just some clear path or it's just some get rich quick scheme to be a producer. It, it baffles me. But man, one thing that I did want to talk about is, is what you're doing right now in, in terms of, of marketing, because I know, I know like right now you obviously post on social media. Um, you use email marketing as well, right? Do you use anything else like SMS marketing or have you tried anything else? Um, for music entrepreneur club, we use SMS marketing. We use fan connect. Right. Um, I use YouTube ads. I use Facebook and Instagram ads. 
Um, oh, I got it. I got I have some beat stars promo credits. I want to use those. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I think content is the first step. Um, and understanding the content strategy and then going into paid advertising um, with really conservative budgets and also conservative expectations is also yeah. the way to go. Right. With, um, with email marketing, for example, I know because on your, on your beat starters, you do obviously sell beats, but then you have sound kits on there as well. But mm -hmm. when I've tried to do that in the past, I know with beat stars, for example, you can't separate that audience. Can you, you can't just target the people who are downloading kits separately to the people that were downloading beats. Have you managed to find a way to separate that? I know you upload sample kits to another website as well. So I'm, my, my, my thought is my guess is that you, you kind of focus from that data there, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. What you could do is, um, you could create in your email, uh, marketing provider dashboard, you could create essentially a funnel, right? Um, and you don't have to pay more for, I do this through MailChimp and you don't have to pay more for it. Um, where you could even send out, you know, if you're sending out a weekly email, right. To yeah. your, all your subscribers, um, some people might just want the beats. Some people might want samples and, and loops. So right. you could send out a separate link to that funnel. And how I did it was I would give away, and I, I'm going to continue doing this. It's just a, a good way to connect with people. Yeah. But give away a sample pack or something and set up the funnel so that in order to receive the sample pack, and it's easier this way too. Yeah. You you have to sign up. You have to provide your email address, and then the link to the download is emailed to you. Right. And through that separate, um, through that separate sequence, they're added to a separate email list for producers, and then you can kind of start, um, you know, separating the 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 two types of of contacts. Right. It's it is. I do wish that it were easier. Um, because I know BSTARS does separate uh certain they separate sales from downloads that kind of thing yeah um but yeah i so i've i've been creating separate contact lists just for beat makers so that i can contact them and i'm not annoying them by sending them my beats right that makes sense then so you've got all the emails going through beat stars in a way and then you'll send out a sample pack and the people that download the sample pack have to go through like a different funnel in a way and then that data gets sent back to MailChimp and you've got that separate tag there. Yeah, you can do that. And I, I believe I had a conversation with the guy from Aweber and he had other ideas as to how to do that as well. Yeah. Um, when you start getting into more advanced sequencing, more advanced email sequencing, because um, it, it gets, it gets kind of deep. And I'm not, it's above my pay grade. So I'm not going <laughs> to talk about it. Cause I don't, I don't have, I, I have a basic understanding of how it works, but you know, th that guy was the expert. So that video is on my YouTube. Yeah. I might have to check that out. Cause my way around it was to, to use Shopify. So I use Shopify for like selling kits, but then I have the beat stars player embedded into one of the webs, into one of the pages. So obviously when someone downloads a kit, it goes through Shopify's data. If someone downloads a beat or buys a beat, then it goes through beat stars. And then I don't know if you've heard of it, but. There's a, um, there's a website called Zapier or Zapier. I don't know how to pronounce it, but that kind of mm. connects everything. It's like a good tool for connecting loads of different websites. So if someone downloads a beat through BeatStars, it sends information there and then it sends information all over the place. And then, you know, you've got everything kind of merged together then. So that's another good way okay. of doing it. Oh, that's interesting. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, but how about SMS marketing? Have you found that to be beneficial? I know that can be quite powerful because obviously the open rates for a start are like far superior to email marketing, but it's a lot yeah, more expensive. They're higher and it, yeah, exactly. A lot more expensive. So I know, I know it works really well for a lot of people. I've had very little experience with it. Yeah, I have done it. I have used it. 
um, I think it's harder to get people to opt in with a with a phone number, right? Than it is with an email. Yeah. Um, but also, I th- for that reason, I think an email a phone number is worth more when it comes to leads, right? So if you can get them, I think a, a email list or sorry, a, an SMS list of a hundred people is probably as powerful as an email list of a thousand people. Yeah. But you need the strategy. I, I would say if you can't figure it out over here, then maybe maybe don't try. I, I don't know. I, I think just have 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 your strategy, and if it works, it works. But I, I think it's everything is worth a shot. I encourage people to try as much as as possible. No, definitely. I think with email marketing, especially, I think people think it's something that you can just use to kind of send out your beats, and people will buy them. I've seen so many people say that they've tried email marketing, but it hasn't worked for them and it's a waste of money. But in reality, they're just not using it right. They don't have sequences set up. They're not sending out valuable, valuable information every week. You know, they're not engaging with people. So I think that's a big thing. That's one thing that I had to learn as well when I started email marketing. I didn't really know what to do with it, but I think I've got it somewhat figured out now. It's one of those things that you keep learning more about as well. Like you think you've got your sequences set up and then you hear about a new one or how you can separate your audience even further and it, it gets deep. I guess that's why this whole team's made just to focus on email marketing. It gets crazy. Yeah, every every part of business ownership is difficult. Yeah. It takes takes work. I mean it's not impossible. I don't want to make it seem that way, but it, it takes it takes a, there's a learning curve with all of it. Right. Are you doing everything yourself right now? Or do you have anyone else on the team? Like you're doing all your own, like social posts, like just everything, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm working like 15 hours a day. Really? <laughs> Do you ever take a day off? Not every day, but uh, no, I don't take a day off because there's always something. No, I've, I have taken some days off, yeah. but I don't know. That's, that's when I really need to. But for the most part, if I take a day off, it doesn't look like I took a day off because I scheduled everything for that, for that day. Right, right. With you. I mean, there's always something to do, isn't there? Like, even if you try and take a day off, you've got emails or DMs or yep. it's never like a full relaxing day. But what does the schedule look like for you these days? What's your usual process? Yeah, I'm guessing it just changes quite a bit. Yeah, you know, life is crazy when you're doing the creative stuff. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I have... Like Mondays, I upload, I schedule all my audio Mac uploads, for example. Yeah. Um, Thursdays, I have the MEC session on BeatStars. Um, every other day, I'm uploading beat content to, to my YouTube, except on Mondays when it's the MEC podcast. Uh, usually weekends is when I post on Instagram. Beginning of the week is when I post on Facebook. It's just, you know, years of, of experimenting with days yeah, and, and seeing what has worked the best. That's, that's what this is a product of. Yeah. I guess you end up just figuring out a routine that works best for you. Everyone's got a different routine. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's vastly different. I mean, some people post on uh, Fridays and that's the greatest day for them. And right for some of us it does and then you know there's research out there like I, I do look at a lot of research just to kind of hone in my testing so i'm not throwing spaghetti at the wall all the time i can google something like when's the best day to to send out an email right um and i believe it's tuesday and there's a certain time frame uh, during which you should dur- during which open rates are highest on right. average but we're talking about averages across multiple industries. So yours might be different. You know, you might have a bunch of fans or customer, depending on the kind of music you make in another country. Yeah. And so that changes things. Yeah, definitely. You know what I mean, so there are a lot of factors. I'd say looking at the research is a great starting point, but if that doesn't work, then don't be afraid to change. Right. Yeah. Cause everything could change that. Like, age for example you could have an audience of i don't know like 25 to 35 year olds and they 
could be working full time. So maybe the best time to contact them is after work, but then someone else might have an audience of 16 to 19 year olds. Maybe they're at college and, you know, maybe after college is the best time to contact them. I guess it's going to be different for everyone. So it's about knowing your audience, kind of looking at your analytics, especially if you're using YouTube, you can see everything there. And then you're going to, that's going to give you some idea. Yeah. Yeah. But man, I know, um, I know you're crazy busy. I don't want to take up another hour of your 15 hour days. So I want to say, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast and yeah, I guess just let everyone know where they can find you. And if there's anything that you're releasing soon, any kits, any projects that you're working on, then yeah, just let everyone know. Just released my first, I'd say super advanced sample composition pack called painkillers. So that's on the sample lab.com. Nice. Uh, but I'm easy to find at DJ pain one, all social media, and then DJ pain one beats.com for my beats and a lot of my sound kits too. Those are all there as well. Perfect. All right, man. Well, once again, I appreciate your time and yeah, we'll keep in touch. Appreciate you. Thank you.